If I can't keep my head held high enough, I'll just be love and watch the smiles come. Bring my spirits up. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still know that I'm blessed. Welcome back to my coverage of the Kristen Smart trial. Heading into week eight, and we're starting midweek on Wednesday. September 7th, 2022, in Salinas, California, at the Monterey County Courthouse. The break was great. There was no court Monday or Tuesday, and some early release days last week as well. Hopefully, the jurors and Kristen's loved ones had some recuperative time. Last week's testimony was a lot. The judge has mentioned on multiple occasions that the trial is ahead of schedule, that's good on so many levels. We're headed out of town in October, and I hope by then we're all celebrating victory and justice for Kristen and appreciating the knowledge they didn't get away with it. And I will continue to pray Kristen is returned to her family some way, somehow. Never a dull moment in this trial. At 8 a.m., as court was prepping to begin, it was announced that court would be delayed till 10.15 a.m., it wasn't till 10.30 a.m. that court actually began. Right off the bat, Judge Jennifer O'Keefe apologized to the jurors for the delay. Apparently, a scheduled witness was sick and unable to appear. It was not clear who it was or when they may be on the stand. I don't know why. First thing I thought was that it was maybe the third sexual assault victim. Only because, can you imagine... Not only the emotional symptoms, but the physical symptoms one would experience having to discuss such things in front of strangers, reporters, Paul, defense attorney who's going to get up in your face. But once I gave it a little more thought, that would be a bad strategy in my opinion. The jurors are still recovering from all the tears and breakdowns of last week. It would make more sense to bring her to the stand later. We had that other delay regarding quote unquote new evidence too. And I don't even know if the evidence was shown. It was never made clear if it was or if it's still to come. So hopefully that reveals itself as well. More testimony in the Christmas Mart trial today after the long holiday weekend and an extra day off. All right, here we go. Let's get into it. Jurors heard from a forensic specialist who helped look for clues where prosecutors say Smart's body was buried. First on the stand was forensic specialist Shelby Liddell. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. She spent 90 minutes answering the prosecution's questions regarding two searches she participated in at Ruben Flores' home. The first search was March 15th of 2021 as well as the following day, March 16th of 2021. And the second search was April 13th and 14th of 2021. The prosecution reviewed Liddell's credentials and experience, similar to the others who were testifying as far as forensic evidence experts, those kind of things. You know how Singer likes to go after them, so they always pre-qualify and let the jurors know their expertise and how long they've been doing it and such. She has hundreds of hours of training and gathering processing, and preserving evidence. She told the jurors about the grids laid out over the soil beneath the deck on the back of Ruben's house. She testified that once they started digging in the grid area, several areas with staining were noticed, where the dirt was lighter colored but surrounded by a dark border. She went on to describe pictures that outlined the discolored areas and identified the depth. She described the slope and varying depths of staining from two feet to four feet below the ground level. She testified that they halted digging once they saw the staining in order to collect the soil samples as evidence. Digging resumed and they saw more staining. The prosecution showed the court dozens of pictures of the excavation site showing the staining in the dirt. Quadrant A, B, then D and C showed staining and she focused on the darker edges and collected as much as she could. She described how the evidence was collected with a special probe and stored in paper evidence bags to help control the moisture. 
The prosecution asked about April's search at Rubens, where an additional quadrant was laid after the deck was removed. Liddell confirmed this and explained that at that time, ABCD was assigned to a new grid and EFGH was assigned to the March search. She noticed staining went up the outer wall of the excavation nearest the outer wall of the house and on the opposite side near the inner retaining wall of the deck. Liddell continued with direct examination and she testified that she also helped process evidence seized during the searches including a cargo trailer parked on the side of Reuben's house. She testified that on April 14th, she observed a travel trailer parked on Reuben's cement driveway and a cargo trailer parked in the dirt on the side of the house. The side access door is shown in blue here. Coincidentally blue, and that will make more sense here in a bit. Liddell was asked about searching the white cargo trailer parked at Reuben's. She said it was cluttered, filled with items. Side note, it reminds me of the Sarah Doe description of Paul's house where she said it was quote-unquote hoarding. The avocado doesn't fall far from the tree, does it? Just kidding. Get it? I gotta break the mental drain sometimes with this case. I hope you can relate. I know nothing about this case is funny. It's tragic as heck. Similar to my approach to life, don't let the heaviness of the world crush you. Live, love, and laugh as often as you can. Okay, sorry, back to the white trailer contents. There were tools, boxes, paperwork, file cabinets, storage racks, and sounds like just a bunch of crap, which in my opinion was probably strategic. The investigators, of course, proceeded to clear out the clutter very carefully from the cargo trailer. Jury question, jury question. They wanted to know if officers wore booties when clearing out the trailer to prevent contamination. Sounds like someone's been watching forensic files to me. The answer was, we put down butcher paper. If they had contaminated the scene with their shoes, we would notice it all over the floor rather than just in one area. The trailer was actually taken to the slow sheriff's office crime lab where Blue Star... Yes, Blue Star, it's like the new luminol, was used. It's a chemical that illuminates with presence of blood with a blue glow. She said the floor showed a positive reaction, but added cleaners such as bleach will also react, and animals on occasion also, but they react differently. It's slightly different. These tests were described in court as being used to identify for further testing and not considered conclusive by themselves. She testified that once Blue Star was applied to the floor of the trailer, after the clutter was cleared, of course. Hmm, side note. Nice try, Flora's family. You can't bury evidence under your clutter and get away with it any more than you can bury Kristen and get away with it. Arr, makes me grumpy. The prosecution displayed the pictures on the overhead projector for the court. The portion of the floor that reacted to the Blue Star was cut out for further lab analysis. The area was a three-foot section of plywood floor and screws from that area. Liddell described a slide pointing out the faint glow of blue. She combined the photos into a composite, making it easier to visualize. The prosecution asked her where the picture was taken and she said it was just inside the access door to the cargo trailer. By the way, Liddell did confirm that photographs were taken prior to removing the clutter, and it was also revealed that the white travel trailer belonged to Mike McConville, Susan's long-term boyfriend, even though she's still legally married to Reuben. With that, the prosecution wrapped up their questions just before noon, and court was able to recess for lunch. Since trial details can be scarce, I like to go back in time as needed to preliminary hearings. It really adds clarity to this case. Here's what was presented to the court in 2020. This evidence was collectively used to proceed to this trial, along with the rest of what we've heard and have yet to hear. Detective Cole 
who has testified as recent as yesterday, September 7th of 2022, was assigned to Kristen's case in 2017. He described the stain in the cargo trailer, actually revealed a stain, quote, similar to a human body, end quote. Hopefully they're using those words in court too. Like I said, I don't know everything that's being said, so I let you know it was said prior and then only stick to the facts is what's said now. But this is helpful, I think, to uh, connect the dots. So this reminds me of the description last week of the stainage and the hole resembling an arm and a hand. Remember that? Oh my gosh, that was so scary. And when I listened to that episode back, it sounded like I was laughing when I covered that, but I was actually... My breath was taken away, basically. As you recall, there was an objection over that evidence, which was sustained last week, which means the jurors aren't to even consider that evidence. So Cole went on to say in court in the preliminary hearing that no other areas reacted to the Blue Star except for that area in particular. He added that paints and varnishes also could uh, react to the Blue Star and other compounds. But just like Liddell said today, the reaction is different. He described it as a bright flash and more white than blue. He described a photo at the preliminary hearing of the cargo trailer's blue glow. Now on for cross-examination by Robert Sanger, Paul's defense attorney. Predictably, Sanger did his best to belittle Liddell's credentials. I feel like that method has not served him well with other testimony so far. It must be worth a shot to him, I guess. Otherwise, he wouldn't keep doing it. And this was, of course, after lunch. And he came out like a bull. Here we go. Quote, The first thing I want to do is put up this picture. And he pauses. Which is 223. And for reference, that's the picture with the blue star reaction on the trailer floor. So you know what he's referring to. Continuing on with his quote. So we all left for lunch and ate our lunch, thinking this is a big blood spot. (laughs) Do you guys think he's a little ticked off? (laughs) He doesn't like that the whole lunch break that was allowed to marinate with everybody. Prosecution objects to this and says, counsel is testifying. And I'm glad the prosecution cleared that up because I was wondering where the question even was. Judge O'Keefe orders Mr. Sanger to ask a question. So Sanger says, well, you're aware that it came back that it was not blood. Answer, quote, I was never told that it is not blood. (laughs) Sanger kept asking questions out of her scope. So she had to clarify that she is not a soil expert. She had to keep saying, I'm not an expert in that. I'm not an expert in that. He continued to question her especially her expertise by pointing out her previous job as an evidence tech with slow PD and that she wasn't doing fingerprints and quote all that end quote. Her answer was I did starting 2015. She further reminded Mr. Sanger that she was on site to collect potential evidence identified by the detectives on the case. And that that's why the anthropologists were hired, because they're the experts in those areas. But Sanger did not deter, and he continued by asking her, quote, If the theory is that a body was buried there and then dug back up, don't you think the stain would be below that level? She told the court that she has no knowledge about the soil staining. And I want to know, so was it frickin' blood or not? Like, The coverage I have access to, it was never clarified why he said it wasn't blood and the technician said that she thought it was. It was just left there, I guess. I mean, possibly leaving slight doubt, but that was just really weird. And maybe it just didn't get reported. I doubt that. I feel like they really would have gone in depth to discredit the blood if they were able. Even uh, coverage would have mentioned it. But I can't say for sure. I'm not in the courtroom, unfortunately. Singer then changed direction slightly, asking Liddell if three excavations were done in Wasna. By the way, you can see the drive to Wasna on our Kristen playlist, and you can get a feel for how remote and rugged the Wasna area really is. 
Okay, back to the cross-examination of Liddell by Sanger. He also asked about another search in Arroyo Grande. I know, assuming can be way off, so I'm going to guess. <laughs> Not assume. <laughs> I don't want to make an ass of you and me. But I'm going to assume that it's Susan's home where they were digging with and using GPR, etc. Because that has also occurred to my knowledge. And many locals believe that Kristen was buried at Susan's house first. But so far, no testimony or evidence has alluded to that at all. They may be steering clear of that as to not muddy the waters because this case is a little sticky as it is. And it does make sense to just stick with the evidence that the jurors can hopefully really sink their teeth into. Liddell admits that she was not aware of the evidence found at the other four locations in question. And then we have another attempt by Sanger that fell flat. He was asking Liddell about the rapid DNA machine, and he motions with his hands and says, basically, it looks like a big, and then he pauses, computer. He says, I would say it's like a big typewriter, but nobody knows what that is. And he laughs. <laughs> he laughs at his own stupid joke, but the people in the courtroom noticed that the jurors just sat and looked super serious still. <laughs> they didn't think it was funny. Side note, how cool is that? Rapid DNA machine. I've never even heard of such a thing. I'm constantly hearing about DNA backlogs that, you know, people are waiting for years to get test results. So hopefully that's something that will benefit that. Singer then goes back to questions regarding the excavation. He shows this picture and he says, quote, somebody here has just dumped dirt onto the dirt. Liddell answers and shuts Singer down. His insinuation that there was sloppy forensic work done. She basically says, the dirt was steps created so officers could get down further to dig the hole. <laughs> Oopsie, Bob. That didn't work out for you, did it? A photo was shown of the area just inside the door to the deck. Singer wanted to know what color stakes were used in the hole where nothing was found. <laughs> Singer says he doesn't want to spend a lot of time on this, but there's something there. It looks like a little leaf or something. At this point, one of the jurors, which was Reuben's jurors, closes her eyes, shakes her head. <laughs> it seems like some of them are really over Mr. Singer. Then Singer circles back again to the staining of grid number one, excavation number two. Question, this stain would be below the level of the body, right? Prosecution objects. Compound, vague, calls for speculation, outside of the scope of the witness, outside their expertise. Whoa, he really threw the book at him. Sustained. <laughs> Singer asked Liddell if she saw any evidence that the deck had ever been tampered with since the house had been built. The prosecution objected again, says calls for speculation, which was overruled. Not sure as far as her answer here. Sorry, sometimes coverage is incomplete, but the question was interesting enough to mention anyway. Next question by Sanger. Well, you've been calling it a stain. What kind of stain is it? Answer. It's a clear discoloration of the soil, and that's beyond my scope of expertise. Sanger says, well, you're an evidence technician. <laughs> and, uh, Chris Lambert used an explanation mark there, so he said it's sassy, apparently. And he's getting aggressive. Let's see how that works out for him. Question. If the stain was dug out and put back in, it wouldn't just settle like this, would it? Answer. I'm not an expert in staining in soil. That's why we brought in an archaeologist. Geez, how many times is he going to ask her questions where she has to answer that it's not her expertise? It's lame. It's a lame strategy, in my opinion. The more I hear Singer's questions, the more I feel like he is underestimating these jurors. I feel like they are smart enough to get it and see through the smoke and mirrors. Next question by Singer. So you're saying the stain could have been deposited between March and April? Objection. Misstates the testimony. Overruled. Answer. I stated that this is beyond my expertise. I don't know. 
Here are a few more questions Sanger had for Liddell. Regarding the blood inside the cargo trailer, he asked her if the cargo trailer was in the same place in both searches done in March and April of 2021. She had to check her photos at break and was able to confirm that yes, indeed, it was in the same location. He asked whose trailer it was and she answered, quote, I believe it was Mike McConville's, end quote. Now for cross-examination of Liddell by Misik, Rubens' defense attorney. Misik asked the condition of the ground below the deck before any of the digging. Liddell answered, it was relatively level. Misik asked if water was added to make digging easier. She answered, no water was used. He asked Liddell how far down they dug before hitting compact soil, making digging difficult. The answer was about four feet. Next question, what's the difference between a stain and discoloration? Liddell has to wait for Misik to turn around. He was hunched over the projector looking through photos. When he does turn around, he asks a different question without even getting the answer to the previous question. <laughs> I don't know why he kind of cracks me up a little bit. It's weird getting to know all these personalities of these players as you are immersed in this trial for, what, eight weeks now. Anyway, moving on. Next question was, what's that red discoloration over there? Adele asked Misik, you mean where the bucket was? Misik says, is that what it was? It looks like discoloration to me. And she says, it's an indentation. <laughs> jury question, jury question. One question inquired about cleaning digging equipment, wanting to know if it was clean between when the samples were collected and if the probe was cleaned prior to sample collection. The answer was, the tools are clean between searches, but not during a search itself. Side note, that actually was a good question. My first thought is that was a juror I deemed had an engineer brain because he or she asks questions where A, it's clear they are paying close attention, and B, they are truly thinking through what's being presented in court. She also answered that multiple probes are used for samples under the deck and also for the control sample from other areas of the White Court property, Ruben Flores's home. Misik asked Liddell, you're not aware of the results of any of the testing? Answer, I heard about one. I believe it was sample 776. Did you collect any roots for analysis, he asked? Answer, yes. If they were inside the soil samples, but she did not specifically collect roots, she said. Prosecution was back again for redirect. He asked about the March excavation of grid one, excavation number two. He wanted to know how long did it take to dig two feet down? She answered, maybe an hour or more. Question, did they appear to be digging carefully and relatively slowly? Answer, yes. And then Mr. Singer was back for recross. Question. At the preliminary hearing, do you remember testifying that the staining had not been disturbed? Answer. That particular stain, because it was a complete outline and did not appear disturbed to me while I was collecting it. Sanger's question next was, did you discuss this answer with the prosecution or anyone at the DA's office? And she answered, they provided me with the transcript of my preliminary testimony, and I realized that I hadn't been clear with that answer. Sanger sighs, <sighs> and it was loud enough to be heard, and then he asked for a sidebar. He's being piss Mr. Pissy Pants. <laughs> then when he came back, the next question was, did you write a report regarding your change in testimony? And she answered, by clarification of testimony, no, I just had a chance to review the transcript for this week. Liddell was finally excused at 3.51 p.m. Wow, what a long day for her. Judge O'Keefe makes an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very full day tomorrow, and we can't start till we have everyone here. Please be here at 10.25 a.m. 
after the jurors are excused, Judge O'Keefe adds for the record that she received a juror question wanting a rough estimate on completion of the trial. All parties agree to leave it at, quote, we are ahead of schedule, end quote. I would love for this to be over this month. Ending in victory with justice for Kristen. Apparently, a juror is ready to be done, too. Court will only be in session Wednesday and Thursday this week. From there, court is expected to be back in session on Monday, September 12th, and Judge O'Keefe maintains that they are still on schedule despite continued delays. All right, time for some tidbits. Someone had requested from Chris Lambert, who's at court every day, in case you didn't know that. He's my main resource. I appreciate him immensely. But someone wanted to know the arrangement in court, so he was nice enough to give us a little chart here. He said it's not to scale or anything like that, but it definitely gives a basic idea of how everything's laid out, where people sit, and that kind of thing. So thanks again, Chris. Apparently, Judge O'Keefe modified the gag order again after the latest motion by the media coalition. We've been waiting for Judge Jennifer O'Keefe's ruling. And on September 1st, uh, an order was filed, actually, with the court. It was basically naming all parties involved, such as attorneys, prosecutors, defense attorneys, investigators, law enforcement clerks, bailiffs, witnesses, judicial officers, and employees, any agent, deputy, or employees of the persons listed, basically anyone involved in the case. They're basically not allowed to discuss any of the happenings of the court. So that's not really new. I don't know why they filed that on September 1st. One of the comments says, protecting the SA victim, I assume? And, and another comment said, would Susan fall in any of these categories? And someone answers, yes, she's listed as a party on the court website. I wondered the same thing. And I also wondered about this as far as why only Ruben's name is on the paperwork and not Paul's too. And I guess the same thing they did. I also was wondering about Chris Lambert. I, I'm guessing that because he's a journalist, but also a witness, that he's still permitted to attend and speak on what he observes in the courtroom. And in even bigger expected news, that was a bit of a letdown, to be honest, actually. Here's how it went down. Just days later, after the modification I just mentioned, on Wednesday, September 7th of 2022, we heard the outcome of the latest modification. And it was related to the Media Coalition's request to modify the gag order to allow televised closing arguments and a televised verdict as well. Remote access, basically. And remember, there were also deadline requirements well, apparently neither the defense or the prosecution met their deadlines to justify documents to remain sealed. The county did file the list, but did not include the justifications. And then they sealed that filing. <laughs> so we have no way to know the reasons. Or if it met the burden of proof needed. The defense didn't even provide a list. The prosecution argued revealing justifications would jeopardize information it wants to shield from the public eye. Prosecutor Chris Prevell got upset with the media coalition's attorney, Mr. Field, because he claimed they in no way met their burden to keep these documents sealed. Sanger called Field, quote, offensive, end quote. And Prevell said he was, quote, bending over backwards to unseal documents with proper redactions while managing a murder trial that has, quote unquote, taken over his life. Damn, that's either drama or things are rough for him. Field back down 
a smidge and assured the court he appreciates the efforts so far, but... He then cites the U.S. and California Constitution and California Rules of Court, which is not happening according to Field. He mentions the First Amendment and there must be an overriding interest that outweighs the public's First Amendment rights. Field says the burden has not been met. Judge ruled the court will continue to unseal documents as soon as possible, but denied the motion to immediately unseal all remaining documents. Sanger actually called members of the media coalition, the entertainment industry, the infotainment industry, (laughs) and maybe news. He says a gag order should remain to protect his client and his father. Sanger says he wants Paul tried in the judicial court, not the court of public opinion. Oh, brother, that so reminds me of the stupid little cards that Susan Flores used to hand out to the media if they approached her. And one of the lines said that uh, it shouldn't be tried in the court of public opinion. Well, she got her wish because it's in court now. I am not sure what the other decisions were regarding the remote access at closing arguments and the verdict. If it was granted, I feel like it would be all over the news. I am not assuming anything here, though. Maybe that ruling is pending. So there's been several modifications, and one was done on this date listed here, September 2nd. But currently, my records show the ruling should have been on September 7th. And today's date, as I'm prepping this, is September 9th. So maybe there's still hope, but so far there's nothing being publicized. We're just going to have to wait and see. And as always, justice. For Kristen. If I can't keep my head held high enough, I'll just be love and watch the smiles come. Thanks for watching. Bring my spirits up. Don't forget to stop and smell the flowers. There's some shit I like to fix, but I still know that I'm blessed.